Hey students, this video is going to walk you through some hypotheses about the history of life. So where did life come from? First, let's talk about what scientists think early Earth was like. Scientists think that early Earth had lots of volcanoes, lightning, and basically it was a really extreme environment, not a place that you or I would want to be. It was hot, hot volcanic, and anaerobic. If you remember from some of our earlier units, aerobic means with oxygen. Whenever you put an in front of a word, it means not. So anaerobic means no oxygen. So there was no oxygen on early Earth. Some scientists think that the first living things were anaerobic bacteria. It makes sense for the first living things to be bacteria because bacteria are very simple. And it makes sense for the bacteria to be anaerobic because there was no oxygen on Earth. So these bacteria did not need to use oxygen. If you'll, if you'll remember from earlier units, another word for bacteria is prokaryote. So remember, prokaryotes have no nucleus. And the only example of prokaryotes on Earth are bacteria. So another way of saying anaerobic bacteria, you could say, anaerobic prokaryotes were the first living things on Earth. So anaerobic bacteria, aka anaerobic prokaryotes, same thing. So where do living things come from? Scientists wanted to figure out where did the first living things on Earth come from. They had two ideas for where living things came from. The first idea was abiogenesis. Bio means alive, Genesis means to make or create. A means not. So A biogenesis, which is also known as spontaneous generation, is the idea that living things come randomly from non-living things. So A means not, bio means alive, so A biogenesis means coming from not alive things or non-living things. So back in the day, a long time ago, like the Middle Ages, scientists thought that mice came from this recipe. They thought that dirty rags or dirty clothes mixed with wheat or grains left alone for maybe a month or about 21 days, a couple of weeks, would turn into mice. They thought that the dirty rags or dirty clothes and wheat left alone would turn into mice. Now we know that if you leave dirty clothes and some food around the dirty clothes, you might have mice there in 21 days. But that doesn't mean that the clothes actually turned into mice. But that was their idea. That's the idea of abiogenesis, living things coming from non-living things. The second option for where living things come from is living things coming from other living things, like this baby lion coming from its mother. It's the opposite of abiogenesis. It is biogenesis. Bio means alive. Genesis means comes from. So biogenesis is the idea that living things only come from other living things. So abiogenesis is the idea that living things come from non-living things, or they can come from non-living things. Biogenesis is the opposite. Living things come from only other living things. So there were a couple of experiments that tried to prove that you can get living things from non-living things. One of the experiments you need to know about was done by a guy named Miller and a guy named Yuri. So Miller and Yuri. We'll read about their experiment and then I'll describe it. So Miller and Yuri carried out an experiment that simulated or a simulation is something that acts like. So they created this contraption over here that acted like or simulated the early atmosphere of early Earth. They shocked gases with electricity and made amino acids. So Miller and Urey made this contraption made of all these tubes. They had one section that has electricity in it, and then they have another section where they can pour in gases. They boiled the gases and then shock them with electricity, and they wanted to see what they can make. So. In this experiment, the gases that were going in were things like ammonia, and methane, and hydrogen gas. You'll notice they did not use oxygen because they did not think that oxygen was in the atmosphere of early Earth. They're trying to figure out where the first living things came from. So they took those gases, shocked them. Okay, that shock or that electricity represents lightning, 
and it turns out that they were able to make something. They made amino acids. So Miller and Urey chalked gases to make amino acids. Now you might say, hmm, well amino acids aren't alive. And that's true, but amino acids are the building block of proteins. If you remember from our unit on organic molecules, we had carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Well, proteins are made of something else. They're made of amino acids. And if living things are made of proteins and other things, if we can make amino acids, that's one step closer to making proteins, which is one step closer to making living things. So Miller and Urey were able to make amino acids by shocking the gases with electricity. So basically, Miller and Urey were trying to figure out if the environment on early Earth could have performed a biogenesis. They're trying to figure out if we can take all these non-living gases that were coming out of the volcanoes and in the atmosphere, trying to figure out if they were shocked with this lightning, could that have made the building blocks of life? Okay, they were able to make amino acids. So why would Miller and Urey have made sure to not use oxygen in their experiment. So if we go back really quick, you see they did not use oxygen here, no oxygen. So why didn't they use oxygen? And it turns out they did not use oxygen because they were trying to simulate the atmosphere of early Earth. And we don't think the atmosphere of early Earth had oxygen in it. So it wouldn't make sense to include oxygen in their experiment because the early Earth's atmosphere was anaerobic. Anaerobic meaning no oxygen. So don't forget that word, anaerobic. So what do you think that the shocks of, ele of electricity in their experiment represented? So let's go back really quickly. You see these volts right here? The shock, the spark. What did that represent that was actually present on early Earth? Well, let's go to our picture. That electricity represents lightning. So we think if lightning can shock gases, it can make amino acids. All right, our next experiment is a lot easier to remember. Think ready, red meat. So ready was an Italian guy who carried out a meat and maggot experiment. He wanted to show that living things do not come from spontaneous generation. A spontaneous generation, again, is like abiogenesis, meaning living things coming from non-living things. So back in ready's time, people thought if you have meat and you just let it sit, that eventually maggots will come from the meat. Maggots look like little white worm thingies. They're almost like a caterpillar that will turn into a fly. So a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Maggots will turn into flies. So uh, Reddy wanted to prove that meat does not turn into maggots. So what he did is he took two jars. He had an open jar and he had a jar that he closed. In both jars he put a steak and he let the steak sit around. So after a couple of days, the jar that was open had maggots crawling all over it. Gross. Okay, the closed jar still had meat inside of it, but there were no maggots. So what Reddy proved is that the maggots don't actually come from the rotten meat. The maggots come when the flies come around, they smell the rotten meat, and they lay their eggs on top of the meat. So in the meat that was closed off in this jar over here with a cover on it, the flies could lay their eggs on top of the cover, but they couldn't actually get into the steak because it was closed off. So that proves that the maggots come from the flies. They don't actually come from the steak. All right, our next experiment is Pasteur. He was a French guy. Pasteur carried out a broth and flask experiment to show that microorganisms, and microorganisms are just like bacteria, he showed that they do not come from spontaneous generation. So if we go back to Reddy, Reddy was the red meat experiment. He proved that larger things that we can see with our naked eye, like flies and bumblebees and bears, they do not come, just appear out of nowhere. Okay, they do not come from spontaneous generation. Pasteur wanted to prove that a smaller living things that we can't see with our naked eye, like bacteria also do not just appear out of nowhere. So what he did, he took a flask, flask is this fancy container right here, and this flask had a curved neck on it that prevents air from easily flowing into the flask. So he took his flask and filled it up with broth. Broth is kind of like 
the liquid that's in chicken noodle soup. So he filled up his flask with broth and then boiled it. So as you probably know, when you boil things, you kill anything that's living in it. That's why it's better to cook your food instead of eating raw food because it kills any bacteria that's inside of your food. So after he boiled this broth, this broth should be sterile. There should be no bacteria growing in it. And since you have a curved neck on it, no bacteria should be able to get into it. And so if you just let it sit around, even if you let the broth sit for a year, it won't get moldy, it won't get rotten because there is no bacteria inside of it. However, when Pasteur broke the neck of the flask off like this, just within days, um, all this nasty bacteria grew inside of it. So what he proved is that the bacteria doesn't come from the broth itself. People used to think that the bacteria just pop out of nowhere and start growing in that broth. He proved that the bacteria are actually floating around in the air, but they can't get into the flask when it has the curved neck. But when you break off the neck, now the bacteria can fall into the flask from the air and grow inside of the flask. So ready? This guy proved that larger things do not come from spontaneous generation. They don't just appear out of nowhere. And Pasteur proved that really small, tiny living things don't appear out of nowhere. So how do living things change over time? So a quick, quick reminder, evolve means change over time. So how do groups of living things change? So we know that humans have gotten taller over time and we got dogs from wolves. So how did dogs, or sorry, how did wolves turn into dogs? How did we get dogs from wolves? So there's two ideas for how evolution happens. Two ideas for how change happens in populations of living things over time. There's Lamarck's theory and there's Darwin's theory. So let's take a closer look at these two guys' theories. So Lamarck thought that living things evolve or change through a process called inheritance of acquired characteristics. Inheritance is like when you inherit brown eyes from your parent. Acquired means something that you get during your lifetime. So Lamarck thought that parents can acquire traits during their lifetime, meaning like they get bigger muscles or they get taller over their lifetime, and then they can pass those traits on to their offspring. So um, basically, Lamarck thought that we got, or we went from a short neck giraffe to a long neck giraffe because the first giraffe might have had a short neck, and then it tried to reach a little bit higher to get leaves that were a little bit higher up, and so it had a longer neck, and when it had babies, its babies also had a longer neck. And then its babies stretched their neck and had babies with longer necks, and then their babies stretched their necks, and so on and so on. We know this doesn't really work, but this was Lamarck's theory. He believed in, or he thought, that living things change through inheritance of acquired characteristics. Okay? We know this is not true. If you have a guy who works out all the time, when he has a child, his baby is not going to be born with a six-pack. It just doesn't work that way. Darwin thought that living things change through the process called natural selection. You can think of natural selection like survival of the fittest. Basically, natural selection says that all organisms or all living things in a population are not the same. So for example, if we have a big group of bunnies that live in the forest, we know that every bunny is not exactly the same. Each bunny might have different traits that help them to better able or to be better able to survive and reproduce. So you know that all people are not the same, everyone in our class is not the same because we all have slight differences in our DNA. We have slight variations. So some organisms will have traits that help them to better survive and reproduce. And if you can better survive and reproduce, you're going to have more kids. And so your kids are going to be similar to you because you're related, right? And so if you have a trait that helps you survive and then you have kids, your kids will also have that trait. That doesn't mean that, oh, you're living in the forest and there are these scary monsters that are walking around and so you need to change so your skin is brown so you can blend in with the trees. It doesn't work that way. You have to be born with these traits. So you can be born with a trait that makes you better able to survive, and then when you have kids, they will also have that trait. So the living things without these beneficial traits or these beneficial adaptations will die off over time because they can't compete with the organisms that are better fit or better able to survive and reproduce. So let's look at this picture over here with the blackbirds and see how this represents natural selection. 
So we've got these three blackbirds, and they're saying, yum, green beetles, our favorite. So these birds are better able to see the green bugs because they stand out against this brown wood. These beige bugs blend in a little bit better. They have an adaptation called camouflage. Now it's not like these little brown um, beetles were born and like, ooh, I need to blend into this wood so I'm going to be brown. They can't help the fact that they're brown just like these green bugs can't help the fact that they're green. But because these brown bugs were born or these beige bugs were born and look this way, they're better able to camouflage and survive and reproduce because the bugs or the birds don't see them as well. And so in the next generation, there will be less green bugs and more brown bugs because the brown bugs survived. They didn't get eaten as much, and the green bugs did get eaten. And then over time, we might not have any more green bugs left. We might only have these beigeish, brownish bugs. This is natural selection. So over time, we might shift what our um, populations of animals or plants look like because one trait might help certain living things better able to survive and reproduce. And the ones who don't have that trait just can't compete with these other animals and they die off. All right, another example of this is the peppered moth. So before the Industrial Revolution, we mostly only had these white moths like this. I'm going to kind of outline it so you can see it better. There's a moth right here. Okay, this is called a white peppered moth. Um, moths really come in two colors. There's these white moths and then there are these blackish moths over here. So before the Industrial Revolution, there was not as much pollution coating the trees in the forest um, in Europe. But, or, so this was beneficial because these light colored moths could blend in with the trees and the birds were less likely to eat them and more likely to eat a dark colored moth that stands out. But after the Industrial Revolution, there was more soot and dirt and stuff covering the trees. So then these dark colored moths right here are better able to camouflage and blend in. They can hide better from the predators. So now it's better to have this dark color because you're more likely to survive and reproduce and hide from the predators. It's not beneficial to be light colored against this dark surface because you stand out and the moths can see or the birds can see you very easily and catch you and eat you. So what happened is we used to mostly have white moths but after the industrial revolution now we mostly have black moths. Now don't think that the white moths turn into black moths. That didn't happen. Think of it like this. Okay, before the Industrial Revolution, we mostly had white moths, so we'll do a bunch of W's for white moths, and we had a few black moths. Okay, because some living things are just naturally born looking a little bit different because of, because of mutations. Now, when the trees became covered with the soot, these white moths began to stand out better, and the birds were more likely to eat the white moths over time, and so the white moths died and were able to reproduce. So the remaining white moths had babies and the remaining black moths had babies too. But just over time, we ended up with more black moths than white moths because the black moths were better able to survive and reproduce. That's called natural selection. All right, our last thing for today says, how did eukaryotes come from prokaryotes? If you remember from one of our first units in biology, we learned that eukaryotes are cells that have a nucleus and other complicated cell parts like mitochondria, chloroplasts, um, and a vacuole. Prokaryotes are simple cells. They do not have a nucleus or other complicated cell parts. The living things that fall in the eukaryote group are plants, animals, protists, and fungi. The only living thing that goes in the prokaryote group is bacteria. So sometimes scientists think that we got eukaryotes from prokaryotes. This theory is called the endosymbiont theory. It is a theory that a large cell with a nucleus, so this is our cell with a nucleus, engulfed smaller cells, and those smaller cells lived inside of the larger cell. You see like this? And they think that some of these smaller cells became things like mitochondria and chloroplasts. If the cell only engulfed um, smaller cells that perform respiration, that would become a cell that's kind of like animals or fungi. If the cell um, ingested the mitochondria-like bacteria and the uh, chloroplast-like bacteria, then it would become a cell that's more like plants 
or algae. So I hope that's helpful um, and stay tuned for some more lessons on evolution.